Coming up. Poll after poll confirms a gradual realisation amongst the British public that the economic damage caused by leaving the EU has been far greater than the Leave campaign said it would be. But rejoining the EU anytime soon is probably not a realistic objective, particularly with the current cabal in Westminster. But I'm confident that the next Labour government, whether it's led by Keir Starmer or whoever, without the baggage of broken promises, jingoistic bluster and brinkmanship diplomacy, will be able to negotiate with European leaders and find ways to restore at least some of the benefits lost through leaving the EU. Let me explain why I'm quite confident. If you enjoy the channel, please like this video, subscribe and hit the bell for notifications of future videos. As someone whose politics were probably more in line with those of Jeremy Corbyn, I've been critical of Keir Starmer's leadership of the Labour Party, and in particular, his inability to score from the series of open goals that Johnson has presented to him. But Keir's coming under a lot of stick at the moment with his Make Brexit Work slogan, and I think that's unjustified. Viewers of this channel will overwhelmingly agree with me that Brexit can never be made to work. But what I like about Starmer's slogan is that by saying make Brexit work, there's a non-confrontational implication there that Brexit isn't working. And I can see it resonating with Leave voters, whilst hopefully not alienating the majority of Remain voters. This early into a Brexit that still hasn't been completely implemented, I don't think the time is yet right for Starmer to push an unequivocal rejoin strategy just yet. And that's partly because the full implications of leaving the EU won't become obvious to the voting public until after the point where the pandemic can be used as a cover. Only at that point will the economic and social damage of Brexit be seen in all its glory. And it's then that an opposition party can be more frank about what should be done about it. Having said that no Brexit could ever be made to work, this is particularly true of the specific Brexit deal we've ended up with. The UKIPI Tory government under Johnson pursued a strategy of taking back control, which for them meant excluding the EU from British national life to the fullest extent possible, whatever the economic and social cost. Even pulling out of organisations like the European Space Agency, Erasmus and the European Medicines Agency, when it would have been perfectly possible to stay within those arrangements without sacrificing any sovereignty and without accruing massively greater costs providing substandard Brexit replacements for these schemes. It was a purely ideological decision by the Johnson government and hang the costs. The hardest of hard Brexits and the least likely to have any chance of working at all. And to think that the Leave campaign was telling us before the referendum that we'd be staying in the customs union and the single market. It feels like a different world since the lunatics took over the asylum. Until this current extremist Prime Minister and Cabinet are given the boot, there can be no honest national debate about how to repair the damage done and move back towards a closer relationship with our nearest geographical and cultural neighbours. Reconnecting with Europe will be a gradual process, including steps backwards at times, because European confidence in the UK's reliability as a treaty partner has been badly damaged by Johnson's lies and the previous Brexit Secretary David Frost's aggressive threats and demands for significant changes to a Northern Ireland protocol which he'd only signed up to just months before. Questions over Northern Ireland's status as a quasi-EU member and the issue of the border down the Irish Sea still need to be resolved. Whether that's through a negotiated reworking of the withdrawal agreement or a united Ireland which demographics alone would suggest is now inevitable at some point in the future. Northern Ireland aside, and Scottish and Welsh independence aside for that matter, there are irresistible forces pushing Britain as it currently is back towards a closer relationship with the EU. One example is the state of politics in the USA. Trump hasn't gone away, and through voter suppression and partisan appointments to electoral offices, him or someone of his political stripe may well return to power in 2024 and end the American experiment with democracy completely. In any case, the UK shares far more common ground with Europe on things like climate change, the relationship with Russia, and a shared interest in reacting to an American first policy in the White House that would affect NATO and defence considerations 
as well as trade. And even with Biden in charge, look at how he pulled the rug out from under UK and European feet in his Afghanistan withdrawal last year. It feels like the UK's best interests would be served by a strong military and economic alliance with Europe, with regular involvement in meetings of EU foreign ministers, as we can no longer rely on an increasingly inward-looking, polarised America, where 40% of the population believe the current president won office through a fraudulent election without proof. And 10% of the American population believe that violence is justified to overturn the results of that last presidential election. I mean, is that the type of country a post-Brexit, isolated, medium-sized nation like Britain wants to be relying on for our global economic and military security? It's quite scary. But in the lifetime of the current government, it's difficult to imagine Johnson and his cohort of mediocrity taking even incremental steps towards closer foreign policy cooperation with Europe. This particular Tory cabinet seem unlikely to agree to work closer with the EU on defence, intelligence or security, despite Britain and France being really the only two major military powers in Europe who are now divided over the issue of EU membership. And their relationship is made even worse by that dreadful AUKUS agreement for American-made submarines to be supplied to Australia in a complete betrayal of American commitments to France and to which the UK was party. And it's pretty damn obvious too that while the current government is in office, the UK won't align with the EU's single market or customs union or financial regulations. Instead, they trumpet pathetic cut and paste trade deals with distant economies like New Zealand, Canada, Japan and Australia, even though the government's own figures from the Office of Budget Responsibility suggest that altogether, these will add less than 0.1% to Britain's GDP. Mainly because the other parties to these trade deals understood only too well how desperate post-Brexit Britain was to reach a trade deal and secured deals that were heavily stacked in their favour to the detriment of UK farming and other industries. And for the same reason, you can forget about a deal with the major global economies. With the USA, not only is Biden not interested, but him or his successor would be insisting on such low standards for their exports of food and other products to us that the British public wouldn't accept it. With China and Saudi Arabia, a trade deal would come at the cost of abandoning so-called British values by supporting human rights abuses in those countries. Everything comes back to an inescapable logical conclusion that Britain's prosperity is best served through a close economic, political, military and trade relationship with Europe. But when will that become overwhelmingly clear to the British people? Certainly not under Johnson's government, who used state resources to continue to subvert, distract and cover up the ongoing Brexit disaster, aided by cover of the pandemic. But probably even longer than the life of the Johnson government. Humans find it hard to change their mind, but as the demographically older Brexit voters have been dying off, and as the overwhelmingly pro-European youngsters reach voting age, we know already that the will of the people, to coin a phrase, has already tipped in favour of rejoining the EU, according to numerous polls. But of course, the other side of the equation is, do the EU actually want Britain back? And I would hazard a guess that this won't be the case for at least a decade particularly in the light of the phony fights that the Johnson government have picked with France over fishing licences and AUKUS. But in 10 years time, the British government will be formed from a new generation of ministers. Fresh faces, without the ideological Brexit baggage of the current cabinet. Already, we know that Brexit has shrunk the British economy by 4% per annum. And that figure will compound the misery year on year. With the massive cost of living increases coming this year, stagnant wage growth and much more competition for better paying jobs from professionals coming to Britain from India and other places as a price paid for the current government's lopsided trade deals, any shine that Brexit still retains amongst even the most swivel-eyed of Brexiteers at this point will, within the next decade, be ancient history. But right now, the most important step is to use our voice and our vote to rid the UK of the current corrupt, incompetent, inward-looking populist government who are doing everything they can to cover up and distract from the realities of Brexit. <laughs>